Good morning, everyone. I want to acknowledge uh, Klaus Schwab and Hilda Schwab. I'm going to introduce these two great uh, adventurers in just a moment, but before doing so, I would like to uh, honor the request of uh, the trustees and staff and Klaus uh, in welcoming you to this first session of the World Economic Forum and say just a few words about the agenda that lies ahead with particular uh, emphasis on what has been for the very first time identified by the 750 economists surveyed annually by the World Economic Forum as the number one threat to the global economy, and that is the climate crisis. This is actually a significant milestone, and it represents a response, in a way, to all of those around the world who are paying careful attention to what is happening in the economy and in our global society generally. This uh, year's World Economic Forum takes place in the immediate aftermath of the Paris Conference, the Conference of the Parties, uh, the 21st such conference, pursuant to uh, the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro back in 1992. And as all of you know, the Paris Conference was an historic achievement for the world. The outcome there exceeded the highest end of the range of expectations that those of us who attended that conference carried into the meetings. Uh, the government of France did a spectacular job in hosting the conference. Uh, ben Ki-moon and Christiana Figueres and all of those at the United Nations who have shepherded this process for so long also did an outstanding, historic job in helping to produce the agreement there. What I want to do uh, in speaking about the climate delivery action agenda, which will be discussed uh, here in Davos over, this, over these next few days, is to draw the connection between what happened in Paris and what is happening here in Davos this week. For a long time, there have been three principal questions about the climate crisis. The first is, must we change for more than 150 years, fossil fuels, principally coal and then oil and now gas, have provided so many palpable benefits for the flourishing of human civilization. A tremendous uh, drop in poverty, increasing standards of living in so many parts of the world, uh, and it, it has been the source of energy, actually almost 85% of all of the energy used in the global economy. So naturally, the first question is, must we change in our historic reliance on these fuels? And for a long time, there was a controversy and a careful deliberation over the answer to that question. But just as the scientific community long since has been nearly unanimous in saying, yes, we must change because even though we didn't intend it, this is putting more than 110 million tons of global warming pollution uh, into uh, the atmosphere every single day, and this is trapping as much extra heat energy in the Earth system uh, as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding on the Earth every 24 hours. Most of this energy is going into the oceans, 90% of it. It's increasing the e water evaporation and loading the atmosphere with, with much more water vapor and leading to these historic downpours and floods and mudslides and the same extra heat is drying out the soils and expanding the subtropical dry zones and creating uh, deserts where none existed uh, previously. It is adding, as it did in the tragedy of Syria, to the historic flows of refugees, which 
create political instability uh, in uh, the places uh, where uh, they are heading uh, and reflect the terrible suffering and tragedy of the places where they originated. These and other uh, consequences, including the spread of tropical diseases to higher latitudes, the melting of the ice and rising sea levels, and the extreme weather events that are directly related to the climate crisis, all of these consequences added to the warnings of scientists have now convinced almost everyone that the answer to that first question, must we change, is yes. The second question has been, can we change? And fortunately, because of the leadership in business by engineers, innovators, investors, and scientists, there has been a stunning development in the sharp decline in the price of renewable energy. Solar photovoltaic energy and wind energy is now cheaper as a source of electricity than electricity from burning coal in a growing number of regions. And according to uh, the authoritative analyses, uh, this decline in price will continue to the point where it will be the cheapest source of electricity everywhere. And the transportation sector is making a transition toward electric vehicles, which will bring another vast area of the global economy into uh, renewable energy sources. So fortunately, the answer to that second question, can we change, is yes. The third question is, will we change? Paris provided the latest and most hopeful answer to that question. 195 nations said, yes, we will change. And the direction of travel has now been established. There was a powerful signal sent from Paris to business leaders and investors, civil society leaders, and society generally, that we now know the direction in which we are headed. That signal sent from Paris is being received by the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Signal sent, signal received. So the question here is, how will we accomplish the change that we can and must accomplish? The climate action delivery agenda, which will be developed here in these next several days, will answer that question of how we intend to change. Now, to start this uh, session and to start the week, we have a fabulous presentation by two adventurers, uh, both of whom I've had the privilege of knowing for some time, and they will tell you of their exciting journey around the world without fuel and without fear. Andre uh, Boschberg is the co-founder, CEO, and pilot uh, of the Solar Impulse. Bertrand Picard is the chairman and pilot of Solar Impulse. And rather than attempting to tell you about their exciting adventure, those of you who have seen the plane and have followed their progress already know what a magnificent achievement we uh, have been witnessing. It is now underway, and we have the great privilege of hearing from these two historic adventurers now. Please join here on stage. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you all. Good morning, Hilde Schwab, Agostino Galvani, ladies and gentlemen. I have to admit that a few years ago, I would have been very embarrassed to come on stage in Davos and speak about climate change and protection of the environment. Because honestly, a few years ago, Maybe it was a mistake from the Green parties, but the protection of the environment was always presented as something expensive, boring, and threatening our lifestyle. And protecting the environment and solving climate change was a big problem because we were asking people to make a sacrifice, to have less mobility, less comfort, less economical development. Today, we are in a time where it starts to be possible to fly around the world in an airplane that has no fuel, that has a perpetual endurance, can fly forever. When André flew from Japan to Hawaii, he was five days and five nights in the air. 
non-stop. We chose that without fuel, we can do better than with fuel. But it's clear that the transition from a fuel society to a non-fuel society will take quite a long time. So we have to understand something that we can do today. Today, we are very, very demanding for IT technologies. We want the latest phone. We want the latest computer, the latest app. But we still have technologies for energy that are 100 years old. Combustion engines lose 73% of their energy for only 27% efficiency. Light bulbs, 5% of light, 95% of losses. Insulation of houses, heating or cooling goes outside immediately, requiring an incredibly high energy bill. Distribution of energy, networks for electricity, 100 years old also, losing a huge part of the energy that has been produced. So we see that when we speak about reducing CO2, CO2 is actually not the problem, CO2 is the symptom. As a medical doctor, I know that we have symptoms, but if we focus on the symptom, we lose the origin. The origin today is the incredibly high amount of energy that we lose because of outdated technologies. Imagine everybody would agree, and especially the governments, to put legal frameworks to replace these outdated technologies by technologies that are efficient. Electrical mobility. The motors of our airplane have 97% efficiency, 3% losses only. Light bulbs. 95% of efficiency on LED. Insulation of houses. You can have energy neutral houses. Networks, smart grids. When we speak of smart grids, it means that the other grids are stupid? Yeah, probably. At least they're old. And this is where we have to understand that this transformation is going to bring job creation, profit, economical development. So when you hear that climate change will oblige people to reduce their economical development, especially in the emerging markets, it's completely wrong. It's exactly the opposite. The adventure today is to replace these old polluting devices with modern technologies that exist today. So when you see in the title of the session today, flying around the world with no fuel or no fear. It's true that what really frightens me is to live in a world where half of the energy we use is lost. Flying in a solar airplane brings much less fear. So let's do something in terms of economic, in terms of finance, in terms of technology, in terms of industry, to bring these solutions to the rich countries to be richer and to the poor countries to become richer also, allowing them to make this development with the clean technologies, like the one we're using on Solar Impulse. And Audrey is going to explain how, with a plane like this, we can defy the impossible. Because what we have to do in our world is to understand that what we believe is impossible is actually not only possible, but it can be easy and profitable. Good morning to everyone. That's true that I think we can say today that everyone knows that we have to decarbonize the world. But when you start talking about ambitious plan to develop renewables, to develop the clean technologies, you will very often hear people say, it's impossible. And that's exactly what we heard 12 years ago when we started the project. And what I would like to do is to share with you some thoughts that we made at the time when we, hear, when we heard, in fact, this uh, statement. So 12 years ago, Bertrand had this idea to fly around the world without fuel, without the dependence on fossil energy, using only renewables to propel the airplane. So certain number of things became clear immediately. First of all, that we had to cross oceans. Second, if we would cross oceans, it would take many days, many nights. 
So that we had, and we needed an airplane which should be able to get its energy every day, but use it in such an efficient way that it can fly through the night and still be in the air the following morning. So energy efficiency became the key, in fact, of the entire project. Explain why, in fact, the airplane is so big, huh? bigger than a 747, simply flies better. Why it's so light? Uh, we need to have a very light airplane to be able to go through the night. So when we came to this conclusion, our first uh, reaction with Bertrand was to contact the aviation industry. And we said, that's what we need, that's what we want. Can you build this? And very quickly, they came back with the, the answer. They believed that it was impossible. But we were sure that there was a way forward. So what it meant for us, first of all, that we had to do it in a different way. Of course, on one side, use different technologies, but I guess also develop a different kind of organization, different mindsets, maybe different values, different culture. And let me give you two short examples. When we designed the airplane, we looked at each part. We tried, of course, to make them extremely light. So you design it, you use software, you use sophisticated technologies to simulate what's happening. And of course, then you test this part. And when you test it, if it doesn't break, normally you are happy. But I was not, because it meant that the part was too heavy. So send it back to the drawing boards to try to make it lighter. And if you look at these ribs on the wing behind me, we had 10 iterations. We started with 90 grams, we went down to 50 grams. But beside the fact that we saved weight, I think what it really meant is that we changed the paradigm in the way we were thinking. We didn't think about saving kilograms, we started to save grams. And this was a critical step for the entire organization to understand in which field we were operating. The second thing I was worried about was that uh, I really wanted, I didn't want to miss any good idea. And I wanted to be able to go away from the boundaries that we set ourselves. So I started to hire people from very different backgrounds, with very different experience, to try to cover the largest domain. So an extremely diversified team. And I'm sure you realize that immediately it was a nightmare to manage. And to give you one example, we built this app in using carbon fibers. So I looked for the company who was the best using this material. And it ended up being a company which designed boats, built boats. The best boats, I agree, because they built the two Alinghi's boats which won the America's Cup for the Swiss teams. But they had no idea about aviation. So when I presented these companies to my engineers, my engineers said immediately, you are crazy. They don't understand anything about what we are doing. It will never work. And when I presented my engineers to this company, they said they don't understand anything about this material. They will never get the benefit out of it. it took me two years to build the ridges, to build the respect. But what happened was it took more time to develop the organization than to develop the technologies. So we pushed the limit of the technologies, but what was important was to push our own limits as individuals, as uh, human beings. I think you can understand by that, that if we want to innovate, if we want to be pioneers, if we want to create and to achieve the impossible, we don't need new ideas. New ideas are not important. If here we all close our eyes for one minute, we'll all come back with a lot of new ideas. And what are we going to do? We're going to kill them one after the other. It's too expensive, it's too dangerous. I might fail, people will laugh at me. I might take a lot, a lot of time to reach it. And 10 minutes later, we will end up exactly as we were before. So new ideas. When you see the exploration world in the 20th century, climbing to the highest mountain, was it a new idea? No, it was a dream of humankind for thousands of years. Mountains were there, but nobody dared to climb on the highest mountains not to destroy the gods, 
not to disturb the mythology that only gods were allowed to live up there. Flying in the sky, it was a dream of humankind also for thousands of years, but it was prohibited also to make a competition with the gods. It's not technology that made the first airplane fly. The first airplane was made out of wood and cloth. The Egyptians could have flown 5,000 years ago. Leonardo da Vinci could have flown with his flying models, but he knew he would have been burned by the church if he had tried. So he was not crazy. We understand that innovation is not a new idea. Innovation is an old belief that we leave behind. If we understand this, we can go very far in changing the world, in improving the state of the world. Because normally, we are on a straight road. We have our conditionment, our education, our experience, our learnings, our dogmas, our paradigms, our certitudes. They keep us in a straight road until there is an obstacle. And when you are in front of the obstacle, you cannot avoid it, and you call it a crisis, a disaster, a catastrophe, or whatever. What is important is to use the metaphor of ballooning. In a balloon, you are pushed by the wind. You are pushed in the same direction, at the direction and the speed of the wind. You're a prisoner, like in life. But you learn that you can change your altitude to find other winds which have other directions, other speeds at other altitudes. And this is what we should try to do in life also. If we want to be innovative and creative, we need to change altitude in our education, our profession, our vision of the world, in our psychological, philosophical, and of course, spiritual understanding of life, in order to find other influences, other solutions, other answers that will bring us in different directions. But for this, we need to drop ballast, like in a balloon. A balloon will never climb if you keep the same weight. So in life, we also have to drop ballast. Our ballast is called certitudes, paradigms, beliefs, all what keeps us heavy. We believe it makes us stronger, but it's wrong, it makes us heavy. When we throw it overboard, then we can start to explore all the different directions, all the different levels. We're not prisoners anymore, we start to be free. Because freedom is not when we can do everything. We can never do everything. Freedom is when we can think everything. When we have all the options open, like in the firework, all the altitudes, all the directions, and what is crisis management, entrepreneurship, what is achieving the impossible, what is creativity, art, adventure, exploration? It's when we explore this vertical axis, all the ways to think, all the ways to act until we find the one that will bring us in the direction we hope. But this will be a decision. It will not be the consequence of our past. It will be the decision for our future. But if we are, front, if we are afraid of the unknown, we might stop. That's a picture I did during the balloon flight around the world 16 years ago. It's the window of the capsule frozen by the moisture of the night. On the other side, you have a sunrise. But you will never see the sunrise if you don't accept to go through the ice. So some people prefer to suffer in the ice they know, rather than to take the risk of going through the ice to see what there is on the other side. What I can urge you to do is to take that risk, because it's worth it. The risk of going through the ice, this is the moment of rupture that obliges us to leave behind the ballast that prevents us to move ahead and to put ourselves in this moment of awareness, of performance, of concentration, to find new solutions, new answers that we did not have before. And like this, we can move ahead. We can achieve the impossible, and we can fly around the world in a solar airplane. So to, to cross these eyes, we need, as individuals, to have the right level of energy. And for me, in fact, to have the right level of energy is to have the right attitude, the right mindset. I guess you may have heard or you understood that last year, in July, so impulse flew over the Pacific, five days, five nights, uh, the longest flight ever done by any type of airplane. 
with a single pilot on, uh, on board and using only sun as a source of uh, energy. And when I did this flight from Japan to Hawaii, people started to ask me a couple of questions. They asked me, I mean, aren't you afraid from this duration? Aren't, are, you going to be, are you going to fall asleep and never wake up? But I looked at it completely differently. And for this, you have to realize that when I was a boy, something like you know, 10, 12 years, 12 years old, I was extremely inspired by uh, pioneers who made the aviation, the aviation we know, uh, we know today. And I told myself that some days, you know, I need to sit in one of these cockpits and try something completely different. So for me, this flight was something special. So what I did was, and what I understood, and what I felt was that five days were going to be too short. Uh, too short to go through this experience I wanted to, uh, to make. I wanted and I needed to enjoy every minute of it. And when I arrived in, uh, in Hawaii, I arrived around 10 o'clock at night uh, over the island, and I decided to land at 6 o'clock the following morning to be able to fly another eight hours, I mean, to enjoy, knowing that this would be, you know, soon becoming history, and I needed to enjoy this uh, very, very special moment. The second question that people were asking, aren't you afraid, in fact, to be drawn down in the Pacific? I mean, to, to be lost, to die? And I tell you, we are not crazy people. But I think we prepared ourselves uh, extremely well. And when you prepare for the worst, when you prepare for the worst, it's a way, in fact, to put the anxiety away. And it's a way to be less afraid about what may, uh, what may uh, happen. And let me tell you a story which happened three years ago when I flew from uh, uh, Washington to New York with the first airplane. At noon, I was flying over the, uh, the Atlantic coast, uh, waiting, in fact, to get the possibility to go to uh, Kennedy Airport, and a helicopter came and uh, to make some pictures of the, uh, of the airplane. And as soon as it got close, it told me that I was losing part of the undercover of the, uh, of the wing. So they made pictures, sent it to the control center. Of course, it was shown to the, uh, the engineers. And the first things I got from the engineers, a few minutes later, was that they were surprised that the wing did not disintegrate yet. A few seconds of excitement, as you can imagine. So I prepared, in fact, to jump out. I organized the cockpit, and I went through the drill, in fact, what I had to do in case I needed to jump out. How to jettison the cockpit, how to fall, how to open the parachute, how to get into the water. And I told myself, if you have to do it, you will know how to do it. So if this happened, you better enjoy it, because you don't have the possibility to jump out of an airplane every day, especially over the Atlantic. But I told you, this calmed me down completely. And I was able, in fact, to complete the flight another nine hours until I was cleared to land at uh, Kennedy uh, late, uh, late at night. But what it told us is that you know, when you are well prepared, it helps to put the pressure away. Uh, it, helped, it helped to go into the unknown with a different mindset. And even being very conscious about every step. And when we are very conscious about every step, in fact, the unknown becomes even attractive. So that's what we experience, and that's what we experience as, a, as a explorers. And I think everyone in this situation going into the unknown can do exactly the same. Thank you very much. Thank you.